way your body moving got me hesitating. I'm looking at you, girl, yeah, you so amazing. Got me complicated, got me educated. When I watch you, I feel the rhythm in my heart. Yeah, when I seen you, girl, I knew it from the start. Moving to the beat, I'm just trying to play my part. I'm addicted, I just can't miss this. By request of you guys, the next book I'm going to be reading is To Kill a Mockingbird. So obviously whenever you start a new book, there's a lot of stuff that needs to be introduced. Let's get right into the chapter. So at the beginning of this book, the narrator introduces her brother whose name is Jem. The narrator says that her brother Jem was four years older than her and that when he was 14 years old, he broke his arm. The narrator says that because of the way her brother's arm healed, one arm was shorter than the other, and that her brother Jem didn't really care about it, but he just cared that he could play football. After the narrator introduces her brother Jem, the narrator changes the subject and talks about the accident and what she thinks caused the accident. The narrator says that her brother Jem thinks it all started when their cousin Dill tried to convince them to get their hermit neighbor Boo Radley out of his house. The narrator says that she thinks that the thing that caused the accident was their ancestor Simon Finch. The narrator then goes into explaining who this ancestor was and why she thinks he may have caused this accident to happen. She says that their ancestor Simon Finch decided to move up the Alabama River to where their family resided. Simon Finch considered himself a Methodist, but he was more interested in the pursuit of money. Simon Finch started out by selling animal furs, then slowly moved his way up to selling medicine, and eventually got a homestead off of the Alabama River, and he was able to buy three slaves and start a cotton farm. Simon's hard work had provided wealth for their family for generations. Nearly every generation of Simon Finch's line had been cotton farmers. Everyone until the narrator and Jem's father. Their father's name is Atticus. Atticus didn't really want to be a cotton farmer, and he decided to study law. And Atticus's brother decided to study medicine. Atticus and his brother also had a sister, and she married some lazy guy, and they stayed at the family farm, where they really didn't do much. After Atticus, the narrator, and Jem's father passed the bar exam, they moved 20 miles away to Maycomb County, Alabama. The narrator says that Atticus, their father, started out being really poor and not having a lot of business, and even his first two clients were the last two people hung in Maycomb County. She says it was because they didn't want to plead guilty and get off without the death sentence, but instead pleaded that the son of a bitch had it coming, and Atticus, their father, couldn't convince them to plead otherwise. After some time, Atticus built up his practice and they started doing really well with money. And Atticus even started to pay for his brother's college to become a doctor. The narrator then describes the hometown in which they live, Maycomb. She says that in Maycomb, everybody was related and that it was a super small town. The narrator says that nobody really moved fast because nobody had anywhere to go. The narrator then describes their living situation. She says that she lived with Atticus, her father, her brother, Jim, and their black cook, Capernia. Oh, hell no! She says that she didn't get along very well with Capernia because she was always telling her to get out of the kitchen and Capernia was always scolding her for doing things wrong. The narrator then explains that her mother had died when she was just two years old and that she didn't really miss her mother because she didn't even know her. She says that Jem, her brother, really missed their mother because he was six years old when she died and so he still has a lot of memories of her. During the summers, their father Atticus would set up play boundaries in their neighborhood for Jem and the narrator. She says that it was easy to keep these boundaries because at one end of the boundary was Mrs. Lafayette Dubois' house and she describes her as being hell itself. And at the other end of their boundary was the house of Boo Radley. And they were terrified of both. One day during the summer when the narrator was six and Jem was 10, they were playing outside when they heard some ruckus from their neighbor's house. Their neighbor next door was named Mrs. Rachel Haverford. They thought it was her dog who they would play with sometimes. So they rushed over to the house to see the dog. When they got there, they saw a kid who was really short just standing there. After some awkward silence, the kid speaks and says that his name is Charles Baker Harris and that he can read. 
The narrator, who was around the same age as Charles, tells him, so what? Charles says that he thought they would like to know, and if they needed anything to be read, he could read it for them. Gemma asked how old Charles was, guessing at four years old. Charles said that he was almost seven years old. This is where we finally learn the name of the narrator, because Jem says to Charles, that his sister Scout could read from almost the day that she was born. Jim makes fun of Charles' name and pokes fun at him for having such a long name when he's so short. Charles pokes back at Jim and says that Jim's name is just as long as his, and that his aunt Rachel told him that Jim's name was Jeremy Atticus Finch. Charles says that people call him Dill. Dill was from Meridian, Mississippi, and he was going to stay with his Aunt Rachel every summer for the next foreseeable future. Dill bragged that his mother was a photographer and said that his mother submitted his picture to a child beauty contest and said that he won $5 and his mother even let him keep the $5. Jem asked Dill if he had seen any movies. Dill said that he had seen Dracula. After Charles or Dill now said this, Jem started to give Dill a lot more respect. Jem asked Dill to describe the movie to him. As Dill is describing the movie, Scout describes what Dill looked like. She said that even though Dill was a year older than her, she towered over him because he was so short. She said that his hair was so blonde and thin that it looked almost white and that he had a cow lick on his head. She said that he had a button-up shirt which he tucked into his shorts. After Dill was done describing the movie, Jem said that the movie sounded way better than the book. Scout interrupts and asks Dill where his father's at. Dill says that he hasn't got a father. Scout asks Dill if his father died. Dill says no. Jem tells Scout to stop pestering him because he approves of Dill now. The rest of the summer, the three of them spent every day playing together. Scout said that Dill fit perfectly into their group because he would take the roles that nobody would want to take whenever they would play monsters or anything like that. Scout, the narrator, said that towards the end of the summer, they started to get bored of their usual games and that's when Dill suggested that they get Boo Radley to come out of his house. Dill throughout the summer was obsessed with Boo Radley and that he would stand across the street at the light post just looking at Boo Radley's house in wonder. Scout says that Boo Radley's house was a house that looked like it hadn't been taken care of in years. She says that the paint was chipping, the shingles were coming off, and overall it just looked like a haunted mansion. Scout then describes the Boo Radley myth. She said that people would say that Boo Radley would go out at night and just look into people's windows and stare at them. She says that she and Jem had never seen him. And even one time, chickens in town were getting mutilated and everybody thought it was Boo Radley. Even after everyone in town found out that it was some crazy person named Addie, who killed themselves, people still suspected Boo Radley of the chicken mutilation and other weird things that happened in town. The Radley's house was adjacent to the school and one of the Radley's trees hung over into the schoolyard and nuts would fall from the tree. Scout says that none of the kids would eat the nuts because apparently the nuts would kill you. Scout then goes into the history of the Radley family and how Boo Radley came to be about as far as she knew. Scout says that every day Mr. Radley would go out at 11 a.m. Scout says that Mrs. Radley would rarely go out and socialize with other women. They lived with their two sons and they wouldn't go to church on Sundays like everybody else. Everybody on Sundays would have their doors open and they would be socializing throughout the town but the Radley's place would always have the doors shut and they would never come outside. The Radley's youngest boy started to hang out with a bad crowd and they started to drink and hang out in the wrong areas. Nobody had the heart to tell Mr. Radley that his son Arthur was getting into trouble. Eventually, Mr. Radley's son got into big trouble and Mr. Connor the deputy arrested all the boys who Arthur would hang out with, including Arthur. The courthouse sentenced the boys to a state school and Mr. Radley pleaded with the judge to let Arthur to be in his care and promised that Arthur wouldn't get into any more trouble. The judge agreed to these terms and after 15 years of this happening, nobody had seen Arthur Radley. And this is when Arthur got the nickname of Boo Radley. 
Whenever Jem would ask his father about Boo Radley, Atticus would tell Jem that it was none of his business and that he needed to worry about himself and not other people. Most of the things that Scout and Jem heard, heard about Boo Radley was from their gossipy neighbor, Mrs. Stephanie Crawford. Ms. Crawford told Jem that one day, Boo Radley stabbed his father with some scissors and that Mr. Radley ran throughout the town screaming that his son was trying to kill him. When the police got there, Arthur was just sitting there and the police took him and put him in the basement for a few weeks. Arthur was supposedly allowed to go home where Miss Crawford said that his father chained him to the bed. Atticus told them that that was all a lie. Early in their life, Scout and Jem would watch Mr. Radley leave every morning at 11 a.m. and during Christmas their other son would come home, but they never saw Boo. One year they heard that Mr. Radley was dying and every day a doctor would show up at their house until Mr. Radley finally died. After Mr. Radley died, Mr. Radley's other son moved home and sort of took Mr. Radley's place in the family household. Mr. Radley's son would do the same routine with leaving to town every morning to get groceries for the family. The more Scout and Jem told Dill about Boo Radley, the more Dill got interested in Boo Radley. Jem described Boo Radley to Dill. He said that he was over six feet tall with scars all over his face. With dry blood on his arms from the cats and squirrels he would eat barehanded. When Dill told Scout and Jem that they should get Boo Radley to come out, Dill dared Jem to go inside the Boo Radley gate, almost into the house, practically. Jem kept making up excuses why he wouldn't do that, saying that everybody would die if he did that. Dill kept calling Jem a scaredy cat, and finally, when Dill said that people in Mississippi were braver than people in Alabama, Jem got some courage. Dill said that he wouldn't tell anyone that Jem went out on a dare if he just touched the outside of the house. Jem agreed, and with all the courage he could muster, he ran and touched the house, and they all sprinted back to their home. When they finally got back to the house, they were panting and stared at the Radley's house, and they saw a slight movement but then the house lay still. And that concludes the chapter. Thanks so much for watching Book Cheats. Please leave that like and subscribe. Uh, thanks so much for watching me during your summer break. You guys are awesome. Have a great day and slack on.